Hello all Royal Rangers, my name is Commander Matthew Kenslow and I'm over here in the United States of America and I've been a Royal Ranger for 20 years and year number 7 as a commander. Thank you so much for checking out this video. The purpose of this video is to go over a merit. In these videos I'm going to walk through every one of the requirements. Now it's important to note that while watching these videos it will not give you the merit. You have to show to your commander that you have watched and learned from these videos. What I recommend you doing is taking down notes for each requirement and then show them to your commander for approval. Some of the purposes of Royal Rangers is to build knowledge, wisdom, skills, and leadership attributes while learning about God's Word and conserving His resources practically and most importantly to have fun doing it. So I'm Commander Matthew Kenslow from the United States of America and be blessed. Hi everybody, welcome to Toolcraft Merit. This is going to be a fun merit. We're going to learn about tools, the safety of tools, how to properly handle tools, etc. But first, let's start with the definition of a tool. A tool is a device or implement, especially one held in the hand, used to carry out a particular function. Here are a whole bunch of different tools. Each of them has a specific purpose to get the job done. We have pliers, wrenches, screwdrivers, etc. Now I have a question for you. Here I have a screw, a nail, and a bolt. My question is, are these tools? Well, no, these are fasteners, but you use tools in order to use these. You use a hammer uh, for a nail. You use a screwdriver or a drill for the screw, for example. So these are fasteners. So again, tools are devices that carry out a particular function. And we're going to go over a few of these tools that I have. Uh, so this is part of requirement one, list 10 commonly used hand tools. I'll go over a lot of them and you just choose 10 of them to write it down or all of them if you want. Let's start back here. Here you have a couple of screwdrivers. Screwdrivers help drive screws through wood. There are different types of screwdrivers. Some of them only go to specific screws. For example, it takes a specific type of screwdriver for this versus that. In this case, you need a different screwdriver. This is known as slotted. And this is known as cross-slotted or Phillips. Now let's talk about wrenches. This is a wrench. This is known as a crescent or an adjustable crescent wrench because you're able to adjust it. The primary purpose of a wrench is turning objects. It provides something called torque, which is the twisting force that usually causes objects to rotate. Here I have a nut and a bolt. Now sometimes it's hard to use your fingers to turn that. And that's where a wrench comes in to help you turn that. You adjust it to the right size and sometimes wrenches are not adjustable. They're also known as open-end uh, wrenches and you could buy them at, for a specific size uh, if you want or you could just get an adjustable wrench and then you just simply turn and then you keep on turning until it's fastened. There are different types of wrenches such as Allen wrenches and a socket wrench in fact, a socket wrench is used um, to help tighten or loosen a nut fast. So when you uh, tighten something like a nut, it's usually righty-tighty. So you turn to the right, and then if you want to loosen it, it's lefty-loosey, and you turn to, to the left. Instead of, like, for example, a wrench, you would just go like this, and then you would lift up a little bit and reposition. Okay, but for a socket wrench, you would put it over the nut and this is what happens. So instead of like coming up and then rearranging and doing that, this turns the nut and then as you turn it this way, the nut isn't moving. So you don't have to worry about it uh, going the other way. So if you're tightening it, for example, 
So like righty tighty, and then you come this way, you don't have to worry about loosening it. And then all you have to do is just change this, and when you change it, then you could go the other way. So that's something neat. That's a socket wrench, also known as a ratchet. Speaking about screwdrivers and wrenches, this tool right here is both a screwdriver and a socket wrench. Um, the parts are right here. You could just take any of these out and then fit them through here. And there's a magnet inside, so that has a strong hold. There are different types. Uh, this one's Torx. And again, like I said before, there's a slotted and Phillips as well. And you just take these out and put them inside. And then you could uh, choose what size you want, and it acts as a ratchet. And then you just push this and bring it down to go the other way. Uh, that's a neat multi-tool right there. Here's another interesting ratchet wrench. You just go like this, and as you see inside, it turns. So here you could be loosening the nut, and then you just turn it around to tighten it. Now let's talk about pliers. Here's an example of one. This is one type. This is known as slip joint pliers, because you could adjust it depending on what the job requires. Here's another type of pliers. These are known as channel lock pliers. And you could adjust it like this, depending on the size that you need. And finally, here are vice grips. Notice what pliers have, unlike wrenches. They have a pivot point also known as a fulcrum. You could see here, right here where the pivot point or the fulcrum is. So if you see where the fulcrum is right here, you'll notice that's where it pivots. Pivot means that it turns on its axis, and this is the axis right here, the axis where it pivots, and these are the jaws of the pliers. Now, what's the use of pliers for grip? That's one of the main things. It's for gripping or turning. Here's an example. Let's say that you need to grip something. That's how you would do it. You could use it to turn uh, or bend things. You could use the pliers to hold something. And then you could hammer something down. Maybe something that's like burning hot. You know, tools usually have insulation uh, to uh, protect you. Wrenches are more suitable for turning things, such as a nut on a bolt. And again, a bolt is a fastener, not a tool. Uh, pliers, on the other hand, are good for holding things. You could use it for grip to hold things, uh, to bend things. You may not want to use pliers when you're dealing with fasteners, like a nut and a bolt. You want to leave that up to the wrench. Here's a hacksaw for cutting wood. Make sure that uh, you have a muzzle on it, on the blade, when not in use. Here's a gardening tool, clippers, a little rusty though. A pocket knife, which is an important tool, something that we'll get to later in this merit. This tool right here is a tire gauge, and its particular function is to measure how much air pressure is in your tires. To use this, you would remove the cap of the valve stem of the tire push this inside the stem, it will fill up in air, and this would pop out like that. And the optimal range is between 30 and 35 PSI, or pounds per square inch. If it's under that, it's time to reinflate your tire. Another tool is what I have back here, the claw hammer. And this is to drive nails through wood. It also has the claw to help pull and remove nails. Here's the hand axe, which we'll get to later. Here's a level to make sure that everything is straight and level. You have something for 45 degree, and you also have a little window right here. When the bubble is in the middle between the two lines, that means it's straight and level. Here's a sheath knife, which we'll get to. 
and as you notice the knife is properly in its sheath. Now these are some of the basic tools for carpentry, towel setting, construction, but here are some tools that you might not uh, realize are tools. We have a stapler. The particular function is to staple things. A pair of scissors is a tool. Tape measure. Outdoor tools include shovel, rake, wheelbarrow, and hoe. What's very neat is that some people got very inventive and created multi-tools. Uh, these two are basically the same, uh, but this one's uh, bigger. This is a neat multi-tool. You just open it up carefully, very carefully. And what you have is another type of pliers known as needle nose pliers. You can see that these will help you in tighter spaces. It could help especially an electrician, for example. Again, you could use these for grip, you could use these for turning, and these are also wire cutters as well. You just put the wire all the way down through and just cut them like that. But this is also a multi-tool because there's a lot of these fold-outs right here. So there's a Phillips screwdriver, a blade, and a whole bunch of things, flashlight. Segwaying into wire cutters momentarily, here's another type of one. Here's one of my grandfather's old rusty tool that he used. You have um, a straight edge, it has uh, a ruler, here's a 45 degree angle, and it's just used uh, for measuring. You could draw a straight line with this too. Here's another one of my favorite multi-tools. It's a hammer on one side, a little hand axe on the other. Uh, just like the other one, uh, there's a lot of you know things that pop out. A blade, Phillips screwdriver, and if you push, this becomes wire cutters. Also hanging out back here is a file. A file could also be a useful tool. Here are additional things that I would contend are tools. A compass, I would say any weather instrument. Uh, this is a barometer, thermometer, and hygrometer. Here's another measuring tool. It's the caliper. It could give you precise measurements. And then there are, are aviation tools. Um, this is what pilots use. Uh, my landlord was a pilot for American. Requirement 2 states list five hand tools used on a campout and there's a lot of overlap with requirements 1 and 2. So tools that could be used for a campout include the hammer, a bow saw, a screwdriver, hand axe of any kind, pocket knives, shovel, rake, wrench, pliers, etc. One last thing, while there are tons of physical hand tools, we must never forget the greatest spiritual tool of all kind, and that is God's Word, the Holy Bible. Amen? Okay, so for requirement three, list and explain the three laws of tool safety. Law number one is common sense. Always handle all tools properly. Never play with them and never use them in a manner that the tool was not designed for. Take care of your tools. So, for example, uh, you wouldn't leave your tools out in the open. You wouldn't use a screwdriver for a hammer. Law two is courtesy. Always say thank you when receiving a tool and you're welcome when passing a tool to someone. We'll be talking about that uh, here in a later requirement. And finally, law three is safety. Choose the right tool for the right job. Use tools in a specific tool craft area. Keep all tools with the cutting edge sheathed when not in use. Keep sharp edges pointed away from the body when in use and follow the rules for each tool. The last three sentences sort of overlap in my opinion with common sense. There is a lot of overlap with common sense and safety. Uh, so again, ch choose uh, the right tool for the right job. If you need extra grip, you'd use pliers. And if you need to turn a nut on a bolt, then you'd use the wrench. One more thing about safety is always make sure that you wear safety goggles or safety glasses like these. Uh, whether you're using hand tools or working with machines, it's always best to uh, have these. Let's now go over the parts of a hand axe. 
AXE could be spelled as AX or AXE. It means the same tool. Now, when I took Toolcraft, they required us to memorize all the parts of all three tools, all 29 of them. I'm not sure about your outposts, so just take notes and show them to your commander. So let's go over the parts. The two main parts are the head and the handle. When the axe is not in use, make sure that it's always properly sheathed. So let's start with the handle. This whole part is called the handle. This up here is called the shoulder. This down here is called the belly. And this end right here is called the knob, or the fawn's foot, because it looks like the foot of a fawn. Now let's go on to the head. This whole thing right here is called the blade of the head. If you see, it tapers downward and comes to a fine point, making it sharp. This whole piece is the blade and this is the face of the blade. The sharp part is called the bit. This point is called the toe and that point is called the heel. So if you can imagine a foot and the person's walking that way, you have the toe and the heel. This part right here is called the front and the other part is called the back. This up here you have the pull. This has a bonus feature of being able to pull nails right here. And I was told that the pull could also act as a hammer as well. And then there's one more part to a hand axe. And it is this thing right here where I'm pointing the laser pointer. This is called the eye of the axe. Here is an axe head before the handle is placed inside. When they make the axe head, they leave a hollow space cut out so that you could fit the handle of the axe through. Let's now go over the parts of a pocket knife in which there are 11 of them. The two main parts are the blade and the handle. Let's start with the blade. The sharpened part down here is called the edge. Up here, is called the false blade, the unsharpened part up here. Where the edge in the false blade meets is the point. Right here is the nail mark. It's where you put your thumbnail in uh, when you open the pocket knife. The unsharpened part of the blade right here is called the choil. Now let's move on to the handle. These are called the bolsters. Inside here is called the lock. When you open the blade, it locks to prevent the blade from, uh, from closing in on itself. This is called the release button. And when you're ready to close it, you press the release button in order to unlock the blade and close the knife. There's one more part to the knife that wasn't on the previous knife and it's these things right here. These are called holding pins. I made this knife myself on March 2nd, 2013 along with other boys from my outpost and the holding pins are there uh, to secure the wood that we carved and sanded ourselves um, to the blade and it was a very neat uh, process. We just put in holding pins and then just cut the excess and then sanded it down. I want to take this moment to explain the difference between a pocket knife and something like this which is also known as a sheath knife. A pocket knife, the blade could be folded and carried in the pocket safely. Whereas this is a, is a fixed blade. This is an unfixed blade. Fixed blade means that it's always going to be fixed like this. You can't fold it or anything. It has to be carried in a sheath. And like I showed you, uh, here's an example of a sheath knife in its sheath. Let's go over the parts of a bow saw in which there are four of them. 
this is a type of bow saw. Some look different. Uh, you could also see that this one has a muzzle on it to uh, protect us from the sharp blade. But underneath the muzzle is the blade. This whole part is called the frame. Here's the adjustment. You could pull it back and you could adjust or replace the blade that way. And this part of the frame is the handle. And you just hold it like this. And it's that simple. Only four parts to a bow saw. Bow saws are good to be used for uh, trees uh, and rounded stumps like that. Here's how you open a pocket knife. You want to use the nail mark to your advantage. And you want to use your thumb and index finger to apply a, a firm grip with a little pressure and pull the blade up and open until you hear the click. When you hear the click, that's the lock mechanism locking it in place. That way, when you use it, it's not going to come back over and slice your finger. To close the pocket knife, you hold it like this, and then you press down on the release button. Okay, that's going to release the lock mechanism. Start to close it, remove any fingers, and carefully close it. A lot of knives are different. Some of them don't have a nail mark, so you just want to use your index finger and, and thumb to apply a little pressure, pull the blade up, and open it. And you hear the, hear the click, that means it's locked, and it's ready to be used. Here's also how you hold the knife properly as well. Now this one doesn't have a release button. Rather, and there's a lot of knives that, that are made this way now, uh, you see this thing right here. This is the thing that slides over that way to lock the blade in place. So all you have to do is use your fingernail to bend it back this way. As you do so, you're able to carefully close the knife. There are a couple of vocabulary terms. Um, there's the sender and the receiver. The sender is the person who gives the tool to somebody, and that somebody who receives the tool is called the receiver. To be courteous, it's always polite to hand anything, especially a tool, where the receiver will grasp it by the handle. Okay, you don't want to hand them the sharp part. And of course, that could go with a hammer, a screwdriver, and same thing with a pencil. You don't want to point the sharpened end of the pencil to somebody. Whenever you're passing a tool to anybody, you want to make sure that you're looking at them straight in the eye. If you're passing a hand axe, you're going to grasp it by the head of the axe and just extend your arm. And then they're going to grasp it by the handle. So you're making eye contact. And this is what you say. You say, ready, while you make eye contact and they'll say thank you. When they say thank you, that's when you say you're welcome and you let go. But you gotta make sure, the reason why we do that is to like double check that they're ready because you don't want any tools to be falling down on the ground, especially close to your feet. So you gotta be uh, very careful and extra courteous that way. When you're passing a hand axe or any tool, you wanna make sure that when you pass it, you pass straight across and not crisscrossing. So if you're passing with your right hand, make sure that the receiver uh, takes it with their left hand so that there's no uh, crossing. Otherwise, if he's not in total control, he might accidentally slice his leg. So now let's practice. You're the receiver and I'm the sender. And remember that the sender has to wait till the receiver says thank you before uh, you let go of the tool and also maintain eye contact. So, ready? You're welcome. Good job! Here's how you properly pass a pocket knife. Make sure that the knife, number one, is closed. 
Now, as you pass it to them, remember that there's no crisscrossing, that you pass straight across. Maintain eye contact, you say ready, they say thank you, you say you're welcome, and let go. Now here's how you properly pass a sheath knife. Again, you want to pass this where it's straight across, you're making eye contact, and the receiver grasps it toward the handle end. Now, suppose that you don't have a sheath. Well, there's something else that you could do. Here's how you would hold it. This knife has a serrated edge, the sharp edge, and the false blade. You want to take your thumb and the rest of your fingers and carefully grasp this part of the knife so that the edge will face away from you as you pass it. So as you do so, you're going to pass it like this, where you're not crossing, it's straight across, and you're going to make eye contact, they'll grasp the handle, you say ready, they say thank you, you say you're welcome, and you just let go. And that's how you pass a knife without a sheath. Here's how you properly pass a bosa. So remember, you always want to give it so that the receiver could grasp it by the handle. So remember, the side that has the adjustment on it is the side that has the handle. And you're holding it on the other side of the frame like this. Or like that. Doesn't really matter as long as you have a good grip on it. And you just pass it straight across, no crisscrossing, eye contact, you say ready, they say thank you, you, you say you're welcome, and you let go. Here's how you properly pass a long-handled axe, or any long-handled things like a rake, or a hoe, or a shovel. You want to uh, take into account that the head is the heaviest part than the handle. So the center is not going to be very uh, strong. It's really heavy toward the head, so you want to grasp it where it's comfortable, and you're able to hold it with one hand like this. Um, sometimes if you're um, like younger or smaller, you might have to have two hands to carry it. Make sure that you leave plenty of room toward the head. Now, when you pass it, just like before, no crisscrossing, it's straight across, watch what the receiver is going to do. The receiver is going to go above your hand and grasp it closer to the head. And you make eye contact, you say ready, they say thank you, and then you say you're welcome as you let go. And that's how you properly pass any long handle tool. Here's how you properly carry a hand axe. Make sure, number one, that it's properly sheathed. If not, then you just have to be extra careful. As you're walking with it, you want to make sure that the, uh, the sharp part is away from you. So again, grasp it close by the head and have it a little bit away from you. Not completely away, but you know, a little bit away from you. And just drop it right down to your side, uh, keep it close to your leg, and just walk. How do you properly carry a pocket knife? In your pocket. There's a clip back here so that you could easily clip it in your pocket. How do you properly carry a sheath knife? In its sheath. And there's a place where you could slide your belt through, right here. Here's how you properly carry a bow saw. You want to make sure that it's muzzled, like this. And then you grasp it by the handle, and you drop it down to your side, next to your leg, and then you just walk. Here's how you carry a long-handled axe. Similar to the hand axe, you want to grasp it by the head and then you're going to drop it down to your side and make sure that the blade is facing a little bit away from you. And again, as you're walking by carrying these tools, uh, make sure that there's uh, nobody around that could run into this or any tool that you're, that you're um, carrying, especially if it has sharp parts to it. And then you just walk. Okay, so requirement eight. Demonstrate how to properly sharpen a pocket knife. Why do we need to sharpen a pocket knife? Well, this right here is a sharp knife. It comes to a point, but over time, it begins to dull. That means the blade starts to get a little bit rounded. So here you have a smaller area. The smaller the area, the sharper the blade, and the sharper the knife, and the larger the area, the more dull it is. 
Here's how to properly sharpen a pocket knife. You usually use something called a whetstone, which is a type of sharpening stone. Now you want to get a little bit of water uh, from like the hose, the sink. I'm using water from my water bottle for educational purposes. And you just want to get it a little bit wet. And make sure that you use a surface where, like this one that it's okay to get a little wet. And you just want to make sure that it's nice and wet. Some wet stones will require you to submerge the stone inside a container of water and then you should see bubbling because of all the air that's inside that particular wet stone and then you just wait for the bubbling to stop before you continue. Let's talk about angle real quick. You want to be consistent with your angle. So this is like a 90 degree angle. You will not do this. Here's 45 degrees. You want to be maybe roughly 10 to 15 degrees. So just about like that. Now since it's ready, you want to take your knife, put it on this end, and you're just going to go this way. And you're going to put a firm grip, maintaining that angle, and you're going to be consistent and do that about five times. So for example, notice that as you do that, there is nothing over here, uh, no hand or anything that could accidentally get hurt. Notice that as I start over here, this side of the blade of the pocket knife is the one that's being uh, sharpened, but as I move about, I'm hitting the rest of the edge this way. Now once you do that about five or six times, then it's time for you to do the other side, uh, same amount of times, so the same number of times, the same angle. That way, like when you saw in that picture, uh, what a sharp knife looks like, it looks like a V. Um, doing it the same angle will prevent it from looking all lopsided, for example. Notice that as you're coming the other way, you may find your hand right here holding this. Well, don't hold it like this up here, but make sure that you keep a firm grip on it so that the whetstone will stay in place. And you just want to carefully this time do everything like before. And you're also lifting up after each time. That way it won't hit your hand or your thumb or anything. So you want to be careful the other way. And that's due to having, you know, right-handedness versus left-handedness. And that's uh, pretty much how you sharpen a, a pocket knife using something like a whetstone, which is made for sharpening knives. If you don't have uh, a whetstone, you could use a smooth rock over by the river. You could also use what I heard, the false blade part of another knife, if you have two knives. And sometimes you could get little machines that uh, sharpen knives as well. So just to recap, you go one way five times, five or six times, and then, then you go the other way. The same angle, the same amount of times, and you do that about two or three times until you're um, confident that you have a sharp blade. Okay, so for requirement nine, explain how tools should be stored and what tools are inappropriate for use for Royal Rangers. At a Royal Rangers event, such as a campout, tools should be placed in a designated toolcraft area, and only commanders and boys who have earned the toolcraft merit and earned their cut and chop card uh, are permitted to go inside. When not in use, they should be safely stored and locked away in a cabinet or tool shed. Why don't you want to leave tools outside? Well, what happens to metal, especially iron, when it's exposed to the oxygen in the air and moisture? Well, it makes iron 3 oxide, also known as rust, and you don't want that. And that's how some of the old tools that I showed you earlier, like tools that my grandfather had, uh, got all rusted in the past. Additionally, all tools should be properly sheathed and only unsheathe it when you're going to use it. Here are tools that are inappropriate for use for Royal Rangers. Long-handled axes, unless in high school. Double-headed axe. Machetes. Swords. Sheath knives, unless you're at FCF. But here are knives that are permissible or allowed for Royal Rangers once you get the toolcraft merit and the cut and chop card. 
Okay, so congratulations, a big congratulations for completing the toolcraft merit. Just show your notes to uh, to your commander. Show them, you know, how to sharpen a pocket knife and how to properly uh, carry and pass uh, the certain tools, and you should be good to go.